Good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item in agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcast system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. The second item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence from Scottish Government officials on the proposed draft regulations to establish a register of persons holding a controlled, controlling interest in land. Uh, may I welcome Keith Connell, Pauline Davidson, Andrew Ruxton and Graham Watson. Good morning to you all. Uh, we'll just get straight into questions. Uh, Finlay Carson. Um, my first questions are fairly straightforward uh, based on uh, what information is contained in the register. So, can I ask you what process was followed on deciding uh, what information was going to be included in the register uh, and, and also give us an idea of maybe what information was considered but discounted? Uh, so, an example might be the nationality of the person being recorded. That one. Um, regulation 3 provides that in respect of an owner or tenant, we're looking to register their name and address um, and the capacity in which they own or tenant the land, and that will be on, entered onto the register. Um, it should also disclose information about the relevant piece of land, so that may be a land register title number or where there isn't such a title number, um, a description sufficient for it to be identified. Um, the intention with the inclusion of the information about the owner or tenant and about the land is to provide the link back to the land register, which is the, the chief source of information about legal owners of land in Scotland, and just to give that reassurance to, to people who are looking to use the register and the information in it, that they are uh, that the information is relevant to the piece of land that they are interested in. Clarify the address of the person concerned. Is that their address, or is there any risk of it simply being the address of a solicitor's office or a holding company? Um, in terms of the recorded person, um, it's. Um, it would usually be their address. If they are using a, a solicitor's office, it should be one that they are uh, genuinely contactable by um, and that um, the correspondence would reach them. Okay. Sorry, Mr Carson. So was there any other information you, you looked at, potentially including in the register, but discounted it? Um, we've, the information we propose to be included we think is sufficient to give that link. We did consider whether our nationality would be necessary to, to support that and we felt that that additional information wasn't required. Um, of course, the Land Register does give some information about um, nationality, for example, of um, overseas legal entities that own uh, land in Scotland that would show where their country of origin was. Okay. To add to what Graeme was saying, I think the key focus is to enable people and communities to contact individuals who might have control over decision making in that piece of land. So we considered what information was required to be registered in order to enable that. So that was the, the rationale between having, having that information. Just on that, nowadays snail mail or whatever you call it is not used particularly often. Uh, why haven't we got information like uh, email address or web address or telephone numbers included in the register? Um, we propose that an address be provided rather than the, the email address or, or a phone number, as we consider that would give more reassurance to the, the person looking to engage with, in this case, the owner or tenant. Um, but the same rationale applies down the line to the people with holding a controlling interest. Um, you know, it's a physical address you know it's, in, in, it's provided to be one at which they can be contacted, so you know it's in use. It's not um, victim to uh, spam filters or anything like that that you would get with an email address. But surely it'll slow down the, the ability for someone to actually contact that landowner. Email's now the, the default method of communication in so many cases. Could it not have been included along with the address, the, the geographical address? In, in this case, I think we've prioritise that level of reassurance, but we'll be looking quite closely to see what comes out of the consultation. Um, it's obviously very important to the policy goal that the information is usable and that it supports that engagement. Um, so we'll be looking to pick up um, points on this if they're, if they're raised in the consultation. OK, thanks for that. Um, you suggested that the register is a way to link back to actually the, the land uh, records. In practice, how will the relationship between the keeper and the lands tribunal operate? Yeah, um, there are two main areas of involvement for the land um, tribunal in the proposed register. Um, they will consider appeals made against decisions of the keeper to reject a security de declaration, and um, they will consider questions referred to them about the accuracy of the, um, accuracy of the register. Sorry. 
Um, that potential for referral of questions about accuracy is intended to be a backstop, where the question is too complex to otherwise be resolved, um, or would require the creation of an entirely new register entry in the register. Um, we have discussed the, with the keeper the role that she'll be playing, um, and had her had her views on that, and we'll continue those discussions um, to support the, the you know the functioning and the operation of the register. Okay. During the discussions, have you discussed uh, how long and how well how many? First of all, how many cases can you predict or guesstimate there might be um, between the keeper and the the, the tribunal? Um, and do you have any idea how it, the, the time process would be to deal with those uh, inquiries? Yeah, um, we are aware that the so the land tribunal does consider questions about the the level of the accuracy of the, the existing land register, and um, so that gives us maybe something of a baseline. Um, although the drivers for referring the questions would be quite different, um, they've given opinions on almost or around ten referrals, I think, about questions of the accuracy since 2015. Um, I think that's correct. So we'd expect a similar, relatively low level of referrals. Where, it kind of, as I mentioned, it should be a backstop and hopefully not the first point of um, recourse okay. um, for ensuring the accuracy of the register. And, and how long is it taking to resolve those ten referrals? It can take. The Land Trans Tribunal obviously has a number of um, of cases that we'd have to consider at a time. So we are mindful that there is a burden on them. We're still in the early stages of um, discussing with them the operation of the referral function, but we're mindful that that shouldn't be an overly long process. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Alex Neal. Um, just looking at uh, the UK legislation, persons with significant control register, I note that the details that you require to provide there are name, date of birth, nationality, country of residence, service address, usual residential address, brackets, it's not displayed to the public, um, and then one or two other uh, things. There are some things on that list, like the usual residential address, that we are not seeking to include in Scotland. Why, when it was decided uh, with the person's significant in, uh, control register, that they should be included, as is basically the case in uh, the company's house register for companies, why have we decided to exclude them, since that's existing practice? Um, that, I think, comes back to the difference in purposes, as we understand them, between the register we're proposing here and the existing um, PSC register. Um, the PSC register is focused on addressing or countering money laundering um, or corruption and has a very active um, law enforcement um, involvement there. Um, and that's why they've required extra information, such as the usual residential address um, and, in fact, the full date of birth, even though the actual date um, itself is not included in the, in the register. Um, the additional details that we've not included, the nationality and the usual country of residence, um, again, that speaks back to the point on um, we've been looking at what information we consider to be sufficient to enable um, people to engage with, uh, with, hold, with those who have controlling interests or control of decision making. And we consider we've done that with um, their name um, and address or contact address, the month and year of birth um, to allow you to distinguish between individuals. So, so so you're not making the distinction that is clearly being made in the person's significant control register between uh, the use that members of the public might make of it and the use that enforcement agencies, uh, such as those who have oversight in the financial services industry, uh, wh wh where there's information clearly being sought and retained related to that, but not published. You are not making that same distinction. Was it something that you considered making that same distinction that's clearly being made elsewhere? I'll pass to Andrew in just a second, but I think, again, it comes back to the, the different functions they're looking to fulfill. So, yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think that's right. And I think that at, at this stage, I mean, th this is an early stage, obviously, in these regulations, but I think, as, as Graham said, this is coming back to what, um, what the regulations are trying to do com as compared to what... Um, as compared to what the, the persons of significant control regime is trying to do. And our, our regulations are focused on that ability to engage. At this stage, we've not focused on um, that, that second part of um, the you know, second purpose, which is what you were, were saying about financial interest. I think there is also a question of, um, sort of legislative competence around that in terms of uh, if 
if the pur our purpose is not to regulate financial uh, the financial services industry or indeed um, counter money laundering or these types of things. So I think it's just to be clear what we're trying to achieve with this register and be clear about what the what the purposes of it are. Um, my my final uh, point. You you made two references there. This is an early draft and you're still considering it. So therefore, my final question is, will you consider uh, making it possible, if not necessarily being able to require, that such information could be uh, gathered as part of the registration process and thus be available at a later date? And I think that issue of voluntariliness might be one that we'll return to in other parts of the questioning. I mean, I think I think we're certainly open to looking at these these issues. As I say, um, we have to bear in mind our, our sort of legislative competence to do these things. It's a point. What could you do, and what can't you do? In terms of going beyond what we have in front of us, mm -hmm. what are you capable of doing, and you've chosen not to, and what are you prevented from doing? I, I think that. Um, there is a question about whether whether our register could gather information for the purposes of enforcing uh, anti-money laundering um, legislation, for example. I don't think that would be something. You know, I think it, what we are the wh what our purpose is essentially is to. Um, increase transparency of land ownership to allow for better engagement with landowners in order to increase sustainable. I, I get that, yeah. mm -hmm. but my question is, given around legislative competence, yeah. what what could you do that you haven't done so far, and what are you actually, or do you believe you're prevented from doing? I think that um, I think that we're. Yeah, so it's going to be quite difficult to give you a hard and fast um, uh, uh, definition of where the line is on competence. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you're hearing is that we've been examining how far we can go, um, uh, and we're open to what comes back from the consultation, and obviously the discussions will continue on where that boundary on competence lies. Um, but we've taken a view that, um, given the purpose of these of this register um, as set out in the legislation. Um, if we go too far into um, areas of, of enforcing money laundering, we're likely to hit a competence mm -hmm. barrier. But it's difficult to, to give a definite, you know, here's the line and this is what we can and cannot do. But we, we hear the, the point that's being raised and, and, and we'll obviously consider that further. Because it's useful to know, I mean, people may have unreasonable expectations of how far you could go, and it's just as well to try and get a clear indication of what is and isn't possible. Mr Neil. Thank you, convener. Um, can I just probe a bit on overseas trusts uh, and their involvement, uh, which is quite significant in the ownership of land in Scotland? We know that we have um, a significant number of rich individuals, dukes and earls and untitled people and so on, uh, who owed land in Scotland, but to avoid tax, um, they set up an overseas trust register in places like the Caymans and so on. Uh, I wouldn't name anybody, but you could name some of these people. Um, so for the, for the purposes of the controlling interest, I mean, the reality is these people really control the land. Uh, it's not about money laundering, it's a, a legal tax dodge. It's, you know, under UK law and international law, they're allowed to do this. So for the purposes of controlling interest, who in that situation is the controlling interest? Is it the person who's got the trust set up and benefiting from the tax dodge? Is it the overseas trust, which usually is really a nameplate somewhere in the Caymans. It's not a company. You would walk into it and find an army of people managing the land over in Scotland, for example. So who, who is or are the controlling interests for um, the purposes of this legislation? Yeah, um, I'll, in relation to trusts, um, and this applies, the provisions in there applying to trusts um, apply equally across whatever the 
the jurisdiction that the trust has been um, consecrated under. And we have tried to cast the net fairly widely um, to catch different forms of control. Um, so we would look to um, register the trustees, and we'd look to register people who can direct the decisions of the trustees. Um, we maybe look to direct those who can remove or appoint trustees or, or otherwise revoke the trust. We set out in paragraph eight of schedule one um, a number of different forms um, of, uh, of, of, of control that we would look to catch. And there is a, a sort of catch-all provision um, there, which is otherwise has significant influence or control over the decision-making of a trustee or trust. And that's designed to catch the sort of many variations that you can see in, um, in how people may uh, use uh, these structures in a way that, that suits them um, and that they may uh, influence the control. That, will be, that point will be a bit further um, elucidated in guidance and um, we'll be looking to take um, our views or examples that people may have uh, be aware of that we can uh, to make sure that we are catching um, control however it is constituted. So in that situation, could uh, both the person who's had the trust set up and who has inherited the land uh, and uh, handed it over to the trust, uh, could both that person or persons and the trust both be registered as the controlling interest? Um, it would depend a little on the formulation, but yes. In, in theory, theory, they could. Be, yeah. Right. So once this register is completed, we should have a fair idea by proxy of who's dodging their taxes in Scotland in relation to land, yeah? Um, I'll, uh, I'll, that may be a conclusion that's drawn. What I would say is I think we're, we're looking, it will be a significant step forward in transparency as to who is controlling that decision making. Well, it's important because, I mean, you know, the, a lot of these trusts avoid uh, paying taxes in Scotland. We've now got control of income tax. Um, uh, they should be liable for income tax, possibly. Um, so this is quite important. So are you linking in with the likes of Revenue Scotland uh, and taking cognizance of their requirements as you draw up this legislation? We'll certainly have conversations with Revenue Scotland going forward um, to, uh, to see if there are links that we, can, that we can be drawing and we can support the work that's ongoing there. Right. So this should make it easier for Revenue Scotland to identify tax dodgers? Um, it may well do. Um, we'll see as, as those conversations develop. Um, we, uh, we'll get a better sense of how that will fit in together. Okay. Thank you. Because you do recognise the hopes and expectations that people have around this piece of work and the opportunities it opens up, not just around transparency. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our core purpose is delivering that transparency to support engagement with people who are controlling decision-making in relation to land. But clearly, this is a significant piece of legislation um, and it's important that we best support government policy across the board as, as we can. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I've looked at interest with this, having been, along with my colleagues, um, Graham Day and Angus MacDonald, on the previous um, committee when the Land Reform um, Act was passed, and I'm, uh, that's not to in any way, uh, and, and uh, also Richard Lyle, apologies, I didn't remember you were on the committee at that point. It, uh, and and uh, 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 Community Land Scotland has obviously uh, taken an interest, and all members did receive a briefing uh, before this um, before this session. And I would be interested to know, um, really, to highlight their question. It's their question, and I and I agree with it. I wouldn't be asking it otherwise. Um, about verification, what is the verification process, which could be quite onerous? On the other hand, um, can could somebody come along and say this is who you can contact and then if there were any issues about um, compliance with one aspect of it or if a if a community group tried to approach that um that person or that trust and and it wasn't in existence or wasn't easily accessible um that would be concerning so it's a verification pro process yes um so it's obviously important to the policy goal of the legislation that the information on the register is robust, um, is reliable, and that, and that it's uh, usable. We haven't been proposing a verification process at the point at which it's received. However, there's a number of measures within the legislation that we're looking to, to uh, drive compliance um, with the register. Um, in particular, the duties to provide information are accompanied by um, criminal offences and may be punishable by a fine. Um, we'll also, the Keeper also has the power to amend the register to correct um, inaccuracies there. Um, and that might be as a result of people drawing to her attention that the information does not appear to be accurate 
or that there has been uh, there has been an issue. And we've already discussed the referrals to the Lands Tribunal as a backstop if that has not uh, taken place to ensure. And I think these in combination, we're looking to deliver um, a significant robustness in the, in the accuracy of the information as far as possible. But, but with respect, that seems to suggest that it's only if things were going wrong that it would be um, the verification, you know, a, a, a weighty verification process would be enacted. Is that, is that your thinking at the moment? In terms of, um, are we focusing on kind of isu where issues have arisen in the register? Yeah, I'm wondering whether at the point of putting in information, yeah. um, as, as expected, uh, when the regulations go through, which we hope they will, will there then, what, what will be the process of, um, of checking that that is valid? As, um, the Keeper Register of Scotland will not be verifying the information as, as they receive it. We have put the onus on the owner or tenant and um, their um, accompanying controlling interest to provide accurate information um, on, the, on the time basis that's within the, the draft regulations. And um, as I mentioned, those are backed up by criminal offences, which I think we've taken quite a serious approach to um, underlining the importance of complying and, and the necessity. Right, thank you. Okay, do you want to carry on? With no, uh, we have the next set of questions. All oh, right, okay, yeah. sorry. I thought. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Anyone <laughs> wants to come in? Sorry, before Claudia Beamish. Sorry, could I refer to my register of interest as a landowner being neither a duke nor an earl, um, <laughs> um, but someone who. <laughs> yet. But someone who owns land yet. in my, my own name. Um, um, I'd just like to ask some questions around part three. Um, and firstly, just to understand the process by which um, you uh, decided on the details of an associate. Uh, what, what did you consider when coming to what, what details of an associate was required? Um, I think this comes back to some of the points we've already discussed a little of today. Um, that we're looking to, by support, um, the information that we've proposed that be included, um, we've prioritised um, supporting that engagement between um, a, a user of the register, whether an individual or community or another landowner, with the people holding the controlling interest. Um, so that's why we proposed um, the person's um, month and year of birth to support distinguishing between um, various errors, if need be, um, or um, their uh, contact an address at which they can be contacted, and obviously their name. C can I just ask about the address? Because um, is that their residential address, or what, what is what is um, in mind here? Because in many instances, it's say if if you are a trustee of a trust that owns land, or a director of a company that owns land, you could just give the registered address of the company or the registered address of the trust. Do you do you have something more specific in mind? Um, no, we've proposed that it be a contact address. Um, the important thing is that the person can be contacted at that address. That may be the address of uh, a company. It may be um, it may be a care of address, but the important that it has to be a very genuine point of contact. It doesn't have okay. to be the residential address. Can I just ask, lastly, about the? Um, I think Regulation 13, subsection 7, contains um, a kind of defence to the um, uh, provision of information that says without reasonable excuse. What do you envisage reasonable excuse to uh, include? Um, so reasonable excuse, so the reasonable excuse provisions are designed to avoid situations where a person is on, as it were, on the hook, um, having a, uh, done their best to comply with the duties or having um, been exposed by another person not complying with the duties on them. So that may be where an owner or tenant has um, investigated um, for their own sort of controlling interests and have um, corresponded with those people and to, to verify the information and has had received no response um, through no fault of their own, they may be considered not to be providing the, the accurate information. So that's where the reasonable excuse kicks in. Um, it may also be that they, the owner tends to take reasonable steps to try and identify the controlling persons and they may not have been able to do so. So that could be um, contacting persons who may be aware of the controlling interest or um, otherwise kind of examining for joint interests that might cumulatively amount to control of interest. But it should be a relatively high bar. Um, it shouldn't be a get-out clause. Um, it should be, it's, it's, it's designed purely to avoid situations where someone else is, uh, yeah. Sorry, do you want to come in? Um, i just say as well that the, the regulations, while setting out um, one sort of example of what a reasonable excuse might be, they don't limit that specifically to that example. So. 
um, it would, would depend on particular cases as well. And, and so it may be that a court would think, think that in some, on a particular set of circumstances, a person had a reasonable excuse. So it is, it's flexible in that sense as well. The, there were, as I recall, uh, substantial discussions at the time of the passage of the bill around uh, legitimate exemptions. And the example that was given was victims of domestic abuse. Uh, as I recall reading through this, that's covered here. Are there any other exemptions that have been identified? Um, as, you, yeah, as you say, we've got the exemption for protecting people at, at personal risk, and um, the victims of domestic abuse is the clearest example of that, probably. Um, we have drawn it just a little wider um, to cover people who may not want to be um, registered because putting them on the register might endanger other people as a result. So the example would be um, a refuge worker where that refuge is um, run by an unincorporated association. If that person can be linked to the refuge, you may give away the location of the refuge. It should be relatively narrow. There shouldn't be a lot of cases. We're not anticipating a lot of cases. Um, and we'll be looking quite closely at um, consultation responses on that one. Yeah. Sorry, Pauline Davidson. And just to add that um, it's in the regulations that there's, there's a evidence that has to be provided yeah. in order to have that security um, declaration made. So um, that is something that the Keeper will be verifying on the point of receipt. Is there a role for Police Scotland in assisting in that process? Um, potentially in the provision of the, the evidence, yeah. um, yeah. that some of the evidence that might be accepted is attestations. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, so that, that would be the sort of clearest link they'd have. Okay, that's good to get that on record. Uh, uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, just looking at uh, the UK legislation, persons of, with significant control register, which I've referred to uh, earlier, um, the indications are that around 130,000 companies are not yet complying uh, with that. Now, you've uh, made the point uh, that you will not be verifying the information. So even within those who are complying and that they've provided information, you clearly will have a proportion where the information is accidentally or deliberately incorrect that you're not checking. I've just heard from Pauline Davidson that you, the keeper will be expected to verify certain things in relation to the exemptions, which sounds perfectly fair to me. So given that there isn't a regime around all this and looking at the significant um, default, I regard 3% as significant, that there is in a similar UK legis register, uh, how well is this actually going to work and how uh, are the regulators generally and the courts uh, going to deal with all this? Yeah. Um so I understand the current compliance rates with PSC are about 98%. Um, as you say, there is room for improvement there, and I think Companies House are taking that um, quite seriously. Um, there are a number of things you can do to um, support accurate information going on to the register. And I think you can, um, Global Witness have done some work with Companies House and looking at how their processes have evolved. There's lessons to be learned on using things like drop-down menus rather than free text entry, and you get um, unintentional mistakes that nonetheless um, lead to inaccurate information going on the register. In terms of, I think you're getting to the point of where if someone is not either um, intentionally or unintentionally not taking the steps necessary to put information on, um, I think we'd refer back to um, the penalties for, for non-compliance. Um, we think a, a criminal offence is, is significant and we have provided for the maximum penalty that is um, permitted within the, the 2016 Act itself. Um, we are speaking obviously with the Lands Tribunal about how they will um, engage with the process of referrals and speaking with Crown Office colleagues about the, the process of um, prosecution as well. So things like uh, addresses can be verified quite straightforwardly by automated means, <coughs> for example, using uh, the Royal Mail uh, register of all UK postal addresses. Although I do enter the caveat that for a period of two years, our house wasn't on the register. It disappeared for some reason. Um, and we only discovered when NHS 24 denied we existed. Um, we discovered we'd disappeared. We're now back. Uh, but that seems to be the definitive place for checking things. Uh, would you expect them to use that? Um, so the, the implementation of the register is obviously um, versus Scotland who will be leading on that. And they have a number of um, processes, a number of possibilities. And we're obviously speaking, to, continuing to speak with them 
Um, so this would be certainly something we could um, we could look at. Well, it, generally the the determinations will be in the lands tribunal. Are they being resourced up to to help on this to an adequate extent? And we're um, still having those conversations with the Lands Tribunal, but that's certainly a point we'll be discussing uh, discussing with them. Um, we don't want to recognise that of not having of not placing additional um, work on the tribunal that then slows down the important work they're doing in other areas as well. So um, uh, we're still considering these points. I, I think my colleague will now ask about penalties, including perhaps the last bit of what's down to me. Right. Um, could you uh, clarify for us, please, what the maximum penalty is um, under the ROCI? Um, so it'll be punishable by a criminal offence and by a fine of up to um, £5,000, which is level five on the scale. Right, thank you. And uh, uh, could, could any of the panel comment on whether um, they think that that is sufficient to deter those who are seeking to avoid um, identification? Uh, is there any comment on that? I, I appreciate what you've... Sorry to, to, to say more, but I appreciate what you've already highlighted, that that is the maximum in relation to the 2016 Act. Um, but I'd still value comment in terms of someone who's trying to avoid detection. I think it's difficult for us to comment on whether um, it's sufficient or not. It's the maximum available to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, we'll be interested in what the responses are uh, uh, to the consultation on that point, but we've gone as far as we can under the current legislation. Well, to put it at its most stark, um, uh, is uh, the ongoing refusal to engage, um, uh, is 5K the price of anonymity? Well, we've, we've, we've heard that point raised, and as I say, it's difficult for us to, to say yes or no to that mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we've pitched it at the maximum level. So what would be the process to um, increase that level if that was um, considered to be necessary? I think the, the, the Land Reform 2016 Act would need to be amended because the, the power to make these regulations includes a power to, make, to create criminal offences, but only up to the level of, of £5,000. Right, I see. Thank you. And uh, are there other offences which might apply for a consistent refusal to register? Is that something that you've considered at all? Um, I'm not asking because I know that there are. I just <laughs> wonder. Um, beyond uh, the criminal offence that we've proposed, um, I'm, I'm not aware of any, but we can, can take that away to consider whether there's any other right. options. Uh, and just uh, further pursuing the enforcement of um, uh, non-compliance, uh, how, how could you explain to us at all at this stage uh, how the Scottish Government would intend to enforce non-compliance and what process it will follow in advance of referring cases to the Procurator Fiscal? Um, in terms of the process before it gets to the Procurator Fiscal, I think that we still need to explore um, that one um, at this stage. So I'm, um, we'd have to pick that up in future with you, Evan Fred. Um, and... Should compliance um, with ROCI be a precondition of land register, land registration? We did consider uh, this potential approach. Um, we can understand the attraction to it. Um, we've taken a, a different approach um, in our proposals for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that making it a condition of land registration or on transacting on the land um, emphasises the point at which you are transacting on the land, where we are keen that the information in the register be accurate um, in the, um, across the piece. So we're proposing duties to, uh, on a, to update on an event-driven basis, um, whereas if you are making a precondition of land registration, you may only get very intermittent kind of key points. The other point that's maybe worth making sure, in relation sorry to Sorry to interrupt, but surely that could be updated, couldn't it? I mean, there could be an obligation to update if things change. Yeah, you absolutely could, but in that case, you're, um, the, the incentives or the, the offences for not updating are equivalent to the ones that we would be equivalent to the ones that we've proposed. So, um, right. so it would uh, remain in the same sort of way. Part of the issue, a little with the event of driven updates, which we've chosen to, which we think is important and we've chosen to emphasise, is that um, if you are making a condition of land registration or of transacting on the land, 
you would need some sort of system of um, registration numbers or placing restrictions on the land. And if you're continually having to update on those, uh, update those or lift and, and restate or replace restrictions, um, then you can potentially, um, there could be potential disruption to the property market as it can take a while for transactions as, um, to, to go through. So we were wary of that and that's one of the reasons we stepped back. We do think it's very important that information on the register is up to date and that's what we've chosen to focus on in this case. So could it be at point of sale then, at point of exchange of the, the formalities of contract perhaps? Um, possibly. Um, I think if you, if the, say there were a registration number that you were, um, that could be updated at any point to reflect a change in the controlling interests, that might disrupt the fact that they might not give the consistency that people are looking for as a sale can take you know, months to go through even on a house or, or in, a, in a much more extended period on a, a commercial property. Um, so I think the, the possibility of updates within that process that could impact the conveyancing process was something we were, we were aware of. Right. Okay. okay, can I ask about, uh, I'm coming at this from a different direction, let's look at possible leverage here to get people to register. The way this register will work and the way in which it will be accessed, is there scope for the register to identify which parcels of land have not got this information attached to them and therefore there would be, it could be a pressure brought to bear on those uh, parcels of land, the owners of them to register? Almost a kind of, um, try to think of an appropriate term, but a list of those who have not complied or a list of the properties that have no compliance attached to them. Um, I think this question links into how we're going to go about publicising um, the, the duties to make sure that people are aware of what, they, uh, what is expected of them and to, that the information gets onto the register. Um, there's clearly going to be a significant amount of work required to do so and we're going to reach across different um, categories of entities. So we're looking to be working with Registers of Scotland themselves, but also with various representative groups, whether that's Community Land Scotland, Scottish Land and Estates, um, the Charities Regulator, so that people um, are aware of what they're expected to be doing um, and are um, ensuring that the information is going onto the register um, in that way. But with respect, Scottish Land and Estates probably aren't your problem here because they have taken a policy position in that, and you pretty much know who Scottish Land and Estates members are because they're part of the communities that, that, that they live in. It's the others that will be the, the issue, I would suspect. Uh, those who don't comply will not be amongst that group. It's an interesting question, uh, convener, because there will be lots of uh, uh, owners of land in whom there is no controlling interest. Mm. If I own land, that my house sits on, there is no controlling interest. So I wouldn't be required to, 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 to register. So we, I mean, we'll have to th see what comes back from the consultation, but the, we can't assume that just because there is an absence of a registration under this, in this register, that someone is hiding something. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if we take this as a, compare it to, to England, where we've had a, a compliance figure of 97%, if we got to something like that, would you be in a position to actively highlight who the three percent were it, it may be possible to discern who they are so for instance the land register will hold information if we're talking about overseas legal entities mm -hmm. it's identifiable that it's held by an yeah. overseas legal entity and it could be that they don't have any controlling interests but steps could be taken to to make sure they are certainly aware of what they should be doing yes and then um, it's considered so th I, I think the point is that it may be that we would have it, it would be better to filter, in a sense, to filter the search mm -hmm. um, according to categories of, of ownership, just as has been yeah. mentioned, rather than assuming necessarily that every entry in the land register um, ought, you know, ought in theory to have a regist uh, an entry in this register. Yes, but I'm just seeking to explore what the options are yeah. to get us to the position we all want to get to. John Scott. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, can I just ask a slightly off-the-wall question and with regard to uh, crofting? and crofting interests and the crofting registers, um, is that covered by this piece of legislation or not? Um, I know the difficulty there's been in the mapping exercise for crofting um, and the establishment there for, of boundaries. Um, I just wonder if you could like to talk around that subject a little, if it's relevant to this. Um, Please. So you want to... I think that we have um, 
And I should declare I'm a landowner. Thank you, convener. Um, but yes, thank you. I am a landowner, not a crofter. But <laughs> yeah. What? Not a duke. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that clarification, Mr. Neil. I'll, I'll yeah. let Andrew come in in a wee second. But just to say, I think the impact on crofters will be. Um, it will depend on how they hold the land and whether it's um, held in a form that's impacted by the or uh, impacted by the regulations. Um, there will be the, the, the link to the, as, as our map based element comes from the link back to the land register, so we're not looking to duplicate the work that's gone on, um, that's gone on elsewhere. The duty on owners or tenants of land is to investigate whether they have any associates. Um, that applies to um, tenants, so it's only of registrable leases of leases over, over 20 years. Um, we also have um, in Schedule 1 to the regulations um, a provision about contractual relationships between individuals, um, but that doesn't include um, sort of simple landlord-tenant uh, relationships. So I think it would depend on the nature of the lease uh, in respect of a croft, whether that was covered or not. Stuart Stevenson. Yeah. Um, just a couple of wee things. Uh, I do own land. I do have a baron in the family. His first cousin once removed. He did die in 1926, so it probably doesn't count. Anyway, um, just on um, trusts owning land, where the ownership uh, details of a trust owning a land may endure for hundreds of years, I take it that's part of the argument why um, we're not simply attaching it to change of ownership because the beneficial interest uh, will change even though the ownership of the land will not. The two are quite different timelines. Right, I'm getting nodding heads, so that's okay. And just a tiny one that's come up since I caught your eye, uh, convener. Um, from the point of view of uh, beneficial interests, um, do the holders of standard securities um, th who will almost invariably be in the land register, do they constitute beneficial interests since they can ultimately direct what happens to the land? I think we've uh, made exception for them in the regulations because there are, there are certain types of relationship that we are that, that we're thinking is not really constituting uh, a controlling interest in the sense that we are looking at. So stand, uh, hold, creditor holding a standard security is one of those. I think, um, for example, um, uh, lawyers, lawyers giving advice to a partnership, for example, you could say that the person, the partnership follows that advice is the, the lawyer exercising influence over the decisions of the partnership that um, that relationship is exempted, so we're not we're not including those types of professional relationships as so, well. So, so in essence, I mean, a standard security is essentially contingent control mm -hmm. rather than yeah. actual control. So, therefore, we're excluding contingencies. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the nature of the relationship. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, uh, Mark Roscoe. Perhaps I can just pursue that theme with you a little bit more. Um, in the regulations, the in the register. Beneficial owners have been specifically excluded, which, as I understand, are persons who enjoy the benefits of ownership, even though title to some form of property is in another name. I mean, this seems like a pretty obvious loophole to me. Can, can, can you explain why uh, beneficial owners have not been included, what the reasons are for that? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think when, when we're talking about beneficial owners here, yeah, essentially what we're talking about is beneficial interests, so where, as you say, where the ownership of um, property is held by somebody else, but somebody can, can uh, obtain a benefit from that property, so a beneficiary in a trust, for example. Um, I think we we don't really use the phrase beneficial owner in Scotland because uh, that's an English, English law term, but I think... Um, what, what's the equivalent? A beneficial interest, I think, is kind of the, the Scottish equivalent, I think. Um, I, I think, again, wh wh what we have taken that to mean in terms of a beneficial interest is purely a financial interest in a particular piece of land or property. Um, and, 
again, this comes back to what, the, what we see as the purpose of the regulations, which is to increase the transparency of the, the persons who are actually controlling the decisions that are made in respect of a piece of land. So, for example, in a trust situation, while a beneficiary of a trust may receive a financial benefit from the, that trust, they may not be in, in, in practice taking any decisions about the, what, is hap what happens to the land. And so I think that the purposes of the legislation, as I've said, is to uh, enable better, uh, better engagement with the people who are actually uh, engage, uh, controlling decision-making in the land. Um, and that's what we've sort of tried to focus on. So in, in the case of that, we focused on trustees and anyone that uh, anyone that's really sort of controlling the the decision making in relation to the land. Um, so how does that that's, how does that, that work in relation to families? Mm -hmm. Because I, I can think of several examples actually under previous land reform legislation yeah. where um, aspirations of communities have been thwarted because of option agreements between members of a of the same family. Now. I'm just wondering if, if you're trying to unpick that and understand where the power, where the influence is in terms of the control of a piece of land for development potential, for, for whatever, how do you actually unpick that if those with a beneficial interest in the development of that land, it's not clear who they are because they're sitting behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. They're not actually included. They're not actually registered. We've, we've tried to draft the regulations quite widely to make sure that... Um, in these sort of unclear situations, if essentially that if there is somebody who actually exercises significant influence or control over the decision making of the trust, regardless of their particular position, they should be registered. So that's what we've tried to do: is is to try and make sure that if there is a if there is control, that person is registered, um, whether or not they have a financial interest or not. Such a person. Yeah. I think it comes back to some of the points we um, discussed earlier about in relation to a trust. It may be a person who can direct the decisions of the trustees, um, maybe the trustees themselves. It may be um, someone who can um, unilaterally revoke the trust, like an all-age beneficiary of a, of a bear trust, for example. Um, or it may be someone who can um, say appoint, appoint or remove the trustees. Yeah. Um, which um, is sometimes included in trust deeds, that sort of formulation. Stakeholders on exclusion of beneficial interests. I, th I think um, when we've been discussing this with, uh, with a whole range of stakeholders, um, I think people have been generally understanding of our, of our approach and um, have, uh, have, have understood the points that we've been making and, and the reasoning behind it. I think we're aware going into this consultation that there's still a difference between conversations being had and actually seeing the full draft legislation and the expansion material with it. Um, so we will expect people looking at once they've had a chance to digest and uh, think and take on more detailed proposals um, to revisit those points and, and those conversations with them. Are there other ways to include these interests, such as a voluntary register or other options? I mean, I think. Um I mean, I think we're open to looking at different ways that we might be able to deal with with these situations, and I think that we're, we are certainly aware that there are a lot of different arrangements that can be reached, and we're certainly, as Graham said, we're looking to explore and test these regulations against that. Um, I think it, again, in terms of what we're able to do or what, what we would wish to do, it comes back to what the purpose of um, the legislation is and, and why we are asking people to register. Um, and I think, again, um, we're the purpose, uh, as we've set out, is to um, to try and identify who is actually controlling decision making in relation to land, in order to increase transparency on that and, and allow for better engagement with mm -hmm. with those with those decision makers. Yeah. And in terms of these regulations and, and other registers, mm -hmm. I mean, what what proportion of Scotland's land will actually be covered by this? The intention in, um, as a result of these legislations or regulations is that there should no longer be an um, land registered in Scotland where, it's, uh, where the controlling interests in that are, are opaque. Um, so that, as you mentioned, does make use of um, the other registers um, that are already in place. 
Um, I can try and give some sort of numbers if that would be um, helpful. Um, I think we understand that there's around about 2.6 million titles to land in Scotland. About 260,000 of them are held by legal entities. We'd expect the majority of those to be UK companies and limited liability partnerships or other entities that are covered by the, the PSC register that we've discussed. Um, but we are aware that um, around, I think, about yeah, 2,500 titles um, are held by overseas legal entities. So those would obviously be picked up by the new, uh, by the new register. Um, there's also land held by individuals that may be held in trust or um, on behalf of partnerships that we picked up by the new register. And we'll be doing work during the consultation to try and um, put some numbers to that scope as well. Mm. Yeah, useful to cover. Yeah, thank you. I, I, mean, I think I touched on earlier the issue of it for East Scotland. Um, so we know what the purpose of this register is, but there is a potential spin off uh, benefit from it which would be where the police are looking to pursue a case of vicarious liability in relation to wildlife crime. And colleagues will perhaps remember that when Police Scotland were in front of this committee previously, they indicated that there had been a situation where they had been investigating the possibility of bringing a vicarious uh, liability prosecution and had to abandon it because they couldn't identify who actually owned the land in question. So it's a long-winded way of building up to asking, have you been talking to Police Scotland about how this can assist them in that way? And how confident are you that, that what's in front of us will get us to a point where Police Scotland can pursue vicarious liability cases quite readily? Of course, with the support of the Crown Office, obviously. Um, we have been in touch with uh, Crown Office and we'll be having those conversations. We're also in touch with relevant um, policy colleagues within the Scottish Government and we're aware of the interest um, in, this, in what we're proposing uh, to the purpose of identifying landowners for, um, around um, vicarious liability. I think uh, we're aware that this, yeah, as I mentioned before, um, we can support a range of policy outcomes here and we're, we're keen to try and do so and, and to explore the possibilities there. I appreciate this to be an interest of, of ongoing, in, uh, sorry, a subject of ongoing interest for the committee going forward. Mm -hmm. Convener, you're aware that the area of policy is, is under the same part of government um, as, as is responsible for these regulations. So wildlife and wildlife crime. Um, so we're, 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 we've definitely uh, made those links. Right. So you would be quite optimistic that this will be of great assistance or considerable interest to the prosecuting authorities in situations like the one I've just identified. Yes. Right. Or that or at least at minimum identifying where there's an absence of information that could then be pursued. Yes. So yeah. it wouldn't guarantee that that information was there, but it would identify where there's a gap. Yeah, right. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, thank you, convener. <clears throat> um, to my view, to make this work, the system has to be robust, informative, usable, but not costly. I'm sure someone else will ask that question shortly about cost. But can I ask, how will the Register of Controlling Interest interact with other registers? Will the information held on registers be signposted from the Register of Controlling Interest? Yeah, so we're um, obviously keen to make the information about controlling interest as accessible as possible. And we are obviously aware that at the moment information is held in different, in different places. So we're exploring with registers of Scotland and others how, how to do that. And some of the things we're looking at is signposting and linking to other registers um, about providing comprehen comprehensive information about where to find out about land in, in Scotland. Um, we think the fact that the register will be free to access and search is an important factor in accessibility. Um, We've had several discussions with registers of Scotland. One of the things we are looking at is the, the feasibility of an electronic link, a technical solution, so that um, information in the new register um, is linked to information in the persons of significant control regime, so that people wouldn't necessarily have to go to two different websites. They, we're hoping, or we're looking at its early stages, that they can go to the new register via Register of Scotland systems and be able to pull in information about controlling interests if that's held in the register belonging to Companies House. You were actually anticipating my next question, right. and that was, what, what are the risks, impacts of not having a single register containing all legally registrable property information? We have so many registers, so much information. Sometimes we can get snowed under with that information. Why shouldn't we have just have 
one register? Well, I think, um, I mean, the, the land register and the Sassines are, are one of the, where, where, where land should all be registered. And we know how important it is that that's all in one place. And that's why um, registers of Scotland have been invited to complete the land register and have some target dates, dates for that. Um, there's also registers of Scotland are, are doing further development on Scotless, which I'm, I'm sure you'll all have heard of, which is a key portal to go into and access all that different information. And we're working with them to make sure that that, that that does make it as easy as possible for people to find that information. So there's a lot of different pieces of work going on. We're also making it a key focus of our consultation so that people can tell us as well, how would it be easier for them if there's something we've not thought about. When registers of Scotland develop the new register based on, on the proposals as they stand at the moment, which could of course, of course change, they will do what they call a discovery process. So there'll be extensive testing with people who want to be able to access that information to take on board how, how, what their feedback would be and how it would be as easy as possible. So when people buy their house, they, they get, and I'm neither a duke or a lord or whatever, but when people buy their house, they get a, a title deed. And in amongst the title deed, sometimes can be a map. So what will this and other registers, will this and other registers be map based and will this, will, and will this happen? And if it is map based, how will that be checked to ensure accuracy as land variations do happen, but sometimes are not recorded correctly? I mean, the, the intention is that the land register will be map based and the new register of controlling interest will be directly linked to pieces of land that are on the land register so in that sense it will be map based. Scotless is very much working towards being a fully map based system although that is a work in progress and based on feedback from people that is being developed and improved, improved all the time. Just to, I mean, just a minor point to add. To, um, the, uh, yeah, to, to, on the point on Scotless, that is going to be the, the chief source of information or the, the route in. We're looking to dovetail with the exact, existing cadastral map in the in the land registers that has expanded, rather than duplicating and creating a new uh, a new map-based element, which, as you would say, would then require to be quite closely maintained to avoid to avoid errors. It's more it's better to to use the existing system. Do you intend to? And, and last question, convener, if, uh, if you allow me. Um, I'm on the, the, the RACI committee. Do you intend to also dovetail this with the uh, information that's held in regard to farmers' uh, holdings uh, under the CAP system? Or is that, uh, is that a no-no? Um, have you got particular information in mind? Well, I, I had an interesting visit to one of the local uh, offices where uh, they showed me the computer system and how they go out to the... The, the land and check, you know, walk around with the, the computer, I'm sure you've seen it, uh, walk around and check the land uh, up to the, the nearest inch of, of, of what people own. Uh, when you get into land registers, etc., people can get very uptight about six inches and, and 12 inches or whatever, uh, and fences do move, uh, as we all know. So are you tying up with other systems like that? Um, the the main source will be the land register um, and the, the cadastral map there. Thank you. Thank you. C can I just pick up, before I hand up my colleague John Scott, I mean, we're all engaged in this from a policy perspective and uh, on a kind of strategic level, but I guess for most people out there, this is about how it works in practice. Can you give us a sense of what it would mean to somebody seeking to find information? How easy do you envisage this be uh, becoming? Yeah. So I think this will improve the transparency and I think a lot of the work we're trying to do about accessibility will generally in time improve um, how people can access the system. So people wanting to find out, say, um, I don't know, there's, there's a community and there's a, a, an urban piece of land and they want to find out who's actually making decisions about that. The new proposals should enable them to find find out from the, the land register the, the idea of the land and then go behind that and find out who's actually making decisions about that. And that should be, uh, we want it to be a, a, a straightforward and smooth process and are working to, to try and, and on do the, that. On the back of that, is there capacity, if someone does that and finds out they can't find out who it is they need to get to, to draw that to the attention of the, the registers? And would there be any scope for following up on that if it was identifying that there was a, a gap in the register? Yeah. 
of the, the new register, yes, yes. There's third parties can tell the keeper of an inaccuracy, and she does have powers, if it's straightforward, to change that. So, yes, there is that. That's the, the kind of first level we're expecting a lot of the inaccuracies. Okay. Keith Connell, did you want to come in there? No. no. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. And can I just uh, ask you about setup and ongoing costs, and what estimate of setup costs and costs to businesses? Uh, uh, what, what are your estimates of that? Costs of compliance. So we currently estimate that it will cost three million to develop and to build and to set up the new register based on um, the the proposed um, draft regulations as they are at the moment. So that will provide a distinct a comprehensive system for accessing information about um, people who control land. Um, that might change if the proposals change, but that's currently the, the early estimate that we're working towards. Um, in terms of costs to businesses, the, the, the partial business and regulatory impact assessment does discuss costs to business, and what we're planning to do is um, to develop that much further and to do a Scottish firm's impact assessment to speak to industry representatives, to businesses and to others to, to, to clearly define individual costs to businesses. On a sort of straightforward business um, registration, a ballpark figure might be a few tens of pounds, a few hundreds of pounds. We have or looked a few at thousand. what, yeah, sorry, at, at what the UK government, um, they're, they're um, business impact assessment for the person of significant control regime and there are some lessons we can learn from that but it's not a straight extrapolation into our new registers because the proposals are different. Um, we think initial costs will be slightly higher for individual businesses and then it will it will reduce down on an ongoing basis. Just to add to that, um, I think their experience has been costs in the tens rather than in the rather than significantly higher. The Scottish firm's impact test that was referred to actually requires us to, to go and speak directly to businesses that are going to be affected and, and to, um, to discuss with them the processes and, and try and reach quite a robust figure on that basis. Thanks very much. And can I also just ask you about the, the ongoing costs um, for the registers of Scotland, the ongoing maintenance of the register? Um, have you had discussions with the registers about those likely costs and are you at liberty to tell us what they might be? Yeah, we, we've had many discussions with registers of Scot Scotland about costs since, since the 2016 Act was passed um, and these discussions are continuing. Um, so the ongoing costs for IT support on an annual basis will be something between 70,000 and 84,000 per annum. That's an early estimate, again, based on the draft proposals and, and could change. Um, there will also be additional staff um, support costs on, on top of that. But as I said, discussions with DRAWS are continuing, and we're pleased that one of the results of these discussions is that access will be free to the register and the current proposals. But we can keep the committee updated on these points of, of finances as costs are developed further. Just, just for the avoidance of doubt or confusion, there won't be any need to build a new IT system, I hope, with as difficult as... Not a completely new IT system. They will need to build a register, which we think will be... People will um, register the details online, and it, so that there will be a new system, but it will be linked to, to others. Right. Thank you. The other thing that might be useful to update us on is the progress around the consultation that you've referred to on a number of occasions. Um, because this is obviously an ongoing situation. So as well as any financial update, if there's anything comes to mind after the session or in the, the time ahead, if you could write and keep us updated, I think that would be appreciated by colleagues. Stuart Stevenson. Um, we've just heard, and I'd forgotten I'd read, that of course uh, applicants will register online. Uh, we previously heard that applicants will not be providing their email address Will they have to provide their email address as part of the online registration process to allow an interaction between the register and the registry? And hence, you will be in receipt of an email address, which you could include in the register. Is that a fair characterisation? Um, the, how the keeper will correspond with um, people who are registering information is, is ultimately an, an operational question. A, a large part of that will be digitised. Um, However, we're, we're not proposing to include the, the email address on the register at the moment, no. But, but nonetheless, as part of the registration process, it will be captured, or an email address will be captured. 
I think the point is an email address. Yes, I made the yeah. distinction, Mr. Connell. Do any colleagues have further questions? Mr. Neil. Just a quick, you, know, you said at the beginning, uh, Graham, that the purpose was to be able to get hold of people. Um, if there is a problem. Now, sometimes the problem, and the convener referred, for example, to wildlife crime, it might be a problem that uh, relates to that, then it's quite an urgent problem. Does it not just make sense to have the email address and the telephone number where, even if you don't make that public, on the public register, uh, at least then you know very quickly where to contact or the relevant authorities know who to contact and to do so PDQ. I mean, it seems daft to me not to capture in this day and age the email address and the telephone number. It's fairly basic. I think Suppo that's supposing the controlling interest is in the Cayman Islands in one of these unfilled offices, um, you know, you're not going to get hold of anybody um, very quickly. Um, so it seems to be just daft not to have an email address and a telephone number. It's an interesting example, and it's a, it's a fair point to raise. I think we can take that one away and look at it. If you do reflect upon that, and it would be useful to hear back from you on it, because Mr Neil makes a very good point. There just seems no reason not to have this information. As he says, you don't need to make it public, but there would be sense in having it. Uh, following on for Alec Neil's question, at the end of the day, you have the electoral role where people can have some information not disclosed publicly uh, to, and some companies buy the electoral role. So, you know, you may want to look at that too. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. I think that was quite useful to get a feel for where we're at with us. Um, you've undertaken to keep us updated. Uh, I'll hold you to that. Please do keep us updated on any progress that's relevant to the committee's consideration. Uh, so I thank you for your time. Um, at its next meeting on the 27th of June, which is tomorrow, the committee will hear oral evidence from the Right Honourable Michael Gove, MP, Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, via video conferencing on the environmental implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and I request the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Five minutes,